introduce our plenary speaker, uh, Professor Louis Pessoa. He completed his training in computer science and computer engineering from Rio de Janeiro. His PhD was from Boston, and that gave him a background in computational uh, neuroscience. And then he rose through the ranks in various positions, and he's now a uh, professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Maryland. Uh, and he is also director of the Maryland Neuroimaging Center. Um, and today, Louis will speak on the same topic as his very well-known book, um, The Entangled Brain, How Perception, Cognition, and Emotion are Woven Together. So please welcome Louis Pessoa. Well, thank you very much for the invitation, for the kind invitation to present here today. I had a lot of, a lot of fun uh, listening to the talks uh, during the day. Okay, so should I venture with this or? <laughs> Maybe just the laser pointer. Okay, so what I'm gonna do today is a little bit different. I just wanna wrap up today, the day by giving sort of like a conceptual overview of some of the thinking that some of us are thinking and that I have for sure been thinking in the past five, 10 years. And uh, let's, see, let's see what you think after, after the talk and the question and answer, we can, we can battle a little bit to, to, to see how well it's, it's, it's received. Okay, so let's, let's start with this, the following exercise. It's, it's, it's where everyone is doing AI and AI is, we can't uh, avoid hearing all the time something about AI. Let's say we're trying to build an architecture. We're conceptualizing the idea. We're considering the idea of, of building an architecture that has cognitive and emotional components. So one possibility to design this robot architecture would be to include a separate component here. And importantly, it has to be on the top. It's called cognition. And it has something here at the bottom. And importantly, it has to be at the bottom which is called emotion. And you know, these, these little arrows here indicate some kind of control of cognition over emotion. So, and then you talk to the engineers, you talk to the AI people, you talk to the neuroscientists, talk to a lot of people, and you devise a really sophisticated cognitive architecture that has all sorts of things, including an input stream that has multiple levels that is more perceptual, if you will, and one output and which is more action oriented and has, I don't know, some something that is cognitive and has some working active space and so on and so forth. And then you think, wait, well, let we have to do something about emotion. Should we include emotion? And perhaps we include emotion as a little small module that interfaces with this large cognitive architecture here remember that it's 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 pretty large right it's just something like that i just I, I just put it here uh, just to interface with emotion in a single slide and in, in the emotion part you might think well what are you going to do with emotion well maybe the robot bumps into something and feels uh, has some emotion events and it feels angry and if he bumps into too many things it, it gets moody and it gets in uh, whatever you do something about that so the question that I have nothing to do with uh, AI and robotics here today, the question is, how do we do that? How does, how does it happen in the brain, in the vertebrate brain, in the human brain? So if you want to consider that, we have to step back and think about how is the brain organized? How is it organized? And how do behavioral functions and mental states, how are these supported by the brain? So if we now, go back, let's say, a little bit more than a century, we have a clue about how neuroscience has attempted to do this in the subsequent century, since Broadman and many others, for that matter, proposed the idea that we could subdivide the cortex itself into a series of, let's say, Broadman suggested around 500, other people suggested Cecile and, and, and uh, Oscar Vogt proposed something around 800. So, it, you know, something like 500 to 200 cortical brain areas. And admittedly, there are some other stuff there, subcortical 
but we have all of this apparatus here that is organizing to these well-defined areas. Why are they defined? Why are they defining well-defined areas? Because it is the fact that all the cortical areas can be distinguished given their structural organization, and that indicates that these areas subserve specific functions. So we have something, a, sort of an axiom in, in biology, that function and structure are so intim intimately tied that the fact that we went in the brain and we collected all these cellular density differences, cellular type differences and whatnot, must mean that they, they should be viewed as specific functional units. So parts of the cortex that are structurally different carry out different functions. So these are the functional units of the cortex. And in fact, of the entire brain, because we can extend that, even though they're not important at all, these regions and subcortex are presumably are doing something like respiration, maintaining my balance here so that, so that I don't fall and so on and so forth. If we fast forward now to the middle of the century, previous century, then we have obviously the computer, the computation or computer metaphor. So in that sense, when we think about an area, it becomes very clear what an area does is sort of implement some kind of input output, output mapping a well defined function. So the project of studying the brain in neuroscience then becomes one of decomposing the brain in its right parts, so that by dividing and conquering all this territory, you can kind of decompose the system much like you would go about trying to understand a really complex intricate presumably only the swiss can do that and a swiss watch of some or clock of some form so what we do is we go and take a look at this region and try to see what it does go here go here go here go here and so on and so forth and, and, and this kind of divide and conquer strategy but this is a very, very well recognized and understood kind of strategy, right? The organization of greater, unorganization of greater complexity is understood in terms of its con constituent parts, its contributed, contribution of it, the, con the contributions of its individual parts. That's not a problem because we can then put together everything and we understand the behavior, the, the, the broader system. So, which is an approach that is obviously central to science and and we have many to thank, including Descartes for getting this started and thinking about this many centuries ago. Okay, but how about the brain? Is it reasonable to think about the brain in those terms? So I guess one could say that this view is defensible if we consider that the brain to be a, if we consider the brain to be a near decomposable system. And by that, we mean a system as suggested by Herbert Simon in the, in, the, in the 1960s, that is a system that can be decomposed in its individual parts, such that by considering these individual parts, we can understand their parts and the whole, right? So the natural place in which science attacks, addresses problems is one of this near, decomp near decomposability according to Simon. <coughs> so what kind of system is the brain? So that's an empirical question. So let's take this biological system. We didn't build it. It's a biological system. Let's, let's take a look at it and see, is it, why does it, excuse me, where does it lie along this continuum here of decomposability? So what I'm gonna try to convince you today is that it's not a strongly decomposable system. And to motivate that, I'm going to describe a few what I've called principles of brain organization. The first principle that I'm going to just each one of these is, is a minute or two. Don't don't worry too much. It's just a, a, a brief uh, introduction to some of these themes that if you're more interested in, we can discuss later. But the first the first principle is the fact that the vertebrate brain and the primate brain and the human brain in particular is exhibits massive combinatorial anatomical connectivity. The second one is that it is a system that is highly distributed functionally and has high distributed functional interactions and coordination. And the third one is that we can think 
as functional units, not the areas as Broadman and others was, were considering, but entire functional <laughs> circuits, or you can call them networks. Okay, what do I mean by the massive combinatorial anatomical connectivity? This would take too long, but just to give an example, it has become obvious at, at a time where we can collate entire literature of the decades of research on anatomical connectivity by hundreds of anatomists that there really is a massive connectivity from any one given co cortical or subcortical for that matter territory to another so there are massive uh, fibers that massive arrays of fibers that connect temporal cortex to the singular cortex the insula to the occipital cortex and to the parietal cortex to frontal cortex and so on not necessarily monosynaptically, but via one or two or three intermediary synapses. So these anatomical connectional systems are highly organized. For instance, if we consider the cortical basal ganglia system, it, it is organized in a way that every cortical area connects to the striatum and is part of feedback loops that loop back via the pallidum and the thalamus collects, uh, uh, connects back to the cortex itself, forming these massive connectional systems. But this is a textbook example that everyone will encounter in, in undergraduate or graduate school. But if, if one wants the exercise, you can go through <coughs> dozens, at, at least one more dozen of these large scale connectional systems that are not as often emphasized. So for instance, massive connectional systems involving the amygdala, obviously in, uh, involving the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the cerebellum, it's in the spotlight nowadays, it's, it's massively interconnected, obviously the hippocampal system, claustrum, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what is the second principle? The second principle is that we have to consider the system not in anatomical terms, it's, that's the backbone. We have to consider it in terms of highly distributed functional interactions and coordination. So we have to understand how regions are functionally in, interrelated. One way to think about that is in terms of how their signals co-vary. And I don't mean pairs of signals, I mean large scale sets of tissue, how their signals are coordinated. But we can start for instance, by thinking about how two signals here might be correlated or co-vary as a first step into understanding this, this, these functional connections, as we call sometimes in the fMRI world. So what, imp what is important then is not simply the, ana the anatomical location of a region, it's act actually its location in a, space, in a space of functional relationships with other regions. So we have to understand this region anatomically, as well as how it's interacting with a large number of regions and how their signals co-vary. <laughs> From the perspective of a specific region, let's say this, this green region here, what is important is what other regions does, does it affiliate with or cluster with at a given time as it forms a momentary functional circuit. So if we take these steps together, what we want to do is that to understand the function, to understand functions in a highly interconnected system, such as the brain, we need to shift away from thinking in terms of individual regions, something like part of dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, area 46. We really have to understand it in terms of these integrated relationships between circuits, functional circuits that are not static or dynamically recruited. So in that sense, the processes that support behavior are implemented by a collective processing across multiple areas, which are dynamically recruited into these multi-region assemblies. And just, just because of my lack of drawing ability, I've been sticking everything in cortex, but this is really should be meant to span the entire neural axis including the midbrain, the cerebellum, obviously subcortex. So the important point that I'm trying to highlight here is that these functional circuits really engage regions of the brain that are quite disparate spatially, 
and should be viewed as highly distributed in, or, in, its, in their organization. Okay, let's, let's step back a little bit and go back to, to what we're facing in the robot problem and understanding how emotion and cognition are organized in the brain. So historically, emotion has been conceptualized as involving a separate and independent nervous system. Right, so this is an idea that precedes McLean, but becomes kind of enshrined in the literature with the notion of the triune brain that McLean proposes the limbic system and, a vis and also called a visceral brain, largely centered on the hypothalamus, but also involved sync parts of the cingulate cortex as well as the hippocampus and so on. This, if we fast forward to today, the circuit, of course, looks quite different, but this notion of a de dedicated system for emotion really still plays a really huge part. So it might be involving regions that were not really thought very deeply before, for instance, the amygdala or perhaps the anterior lobe or something that, that, that didn't catch the attention of early investigators. But the important aspect here is that this dedicated circuit idea is, is very much a central concept. And it's even more so than that, because even within this dedicated circuit, there always has had a specific structure that has played a really disproportionate role. In the 1920s to, let's say, 40s and 50s, the hypothalamus was sort of the center of this emotional brain. In fact, so much so that it was conceptualized that regions that were strongly and monosynaptically connected to the hypothalamus were to be named part of the limbic brain, it would, almost like in a definitional sense of the limbic brain. In the last 30 years or so, it's not that the hypothalamus is, is not important, but really the big star, and we've talked about it a few times even today already, it's, it's, it's clearly the amygdala. But what I like to suggest is that going back to principle one is that if we go back to the, what we know about anatomical connectivity, there are hints that we might be looking at these issues from sort of the wrong angle. For the amygdala itself, I mean, it's drawn here sort of at the center of this, this diagram here. It doesn't mean that it's the most central region, the most connected region in the whole brain. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. It's just how, how it actually turned out in this diagram. But it's what, what they meant to be, the, the point to be conveyed here is that it's massively interconnected and this is just showing cortex because it's also massively interconnected with subcortical areas. And some have estimated that it might have even as, as many as 500 to 1000 connections to other regions. So given this, uh, the framework that I have been uh, sort of using to guide my research is, is one in which integration of information plays a central role and of course, we have our old friends, perception and cognition, which are always there, have always been there for many, many, many decades. And they're also interconnected in important ways. But the kinds of studies that we've done in my lab for the past uh, 20 plus years have been to try to understand how information of effective negative, uh, in the effective negative part of the spectrum or on the positive end of the spectrum here, just separating just for com convenience sake, uh, affect overall processing in a way that we can understand the whole process a little bit more integrated. I'm, I'm not gonna be giving a talk about the research that I did in my lab. I'm just gonna touch upon a couple of studies very, very briefly, because I wanna go back to these conceptual issues in a second. So, Just in terms a little bit in terms of the background of, of the study that I want to present was these ideas that became quite popular in the late 90s and the beginning of the 2000s that Ledoux and many others were advocating for the idea that there's a specialized module for fear processing and that's centered on the amygdala. You know, and the example that was given is that it's really an evolutionary sort of development that it's really important for even survival. You know, you're, you, you're, you're, let's say, somewhere in, in America, in, in, in Arizona, where there's these rattlesnakes, and you are actually uh, walking about, but you, you, you're, not, you're not looking at this rattlesnake, poisonous rattlesnake, but your field of view is such that you, the, the, 
the rattlesnake is in your field of view, even though you're not attending to it, that's not a problem because you react automatically to this stimulus and you have this, this emotional reaction, increased heart rate, changes in blood pressure and you muscle contraction, you run away and survive. So that was a really uh, potent view, powerful view of how this module was ever so important for even for survival. So around 2008 or nine, and uh, Ralph Adolfs and I, we decided to evaluate this, this, uh, <coughs> these ideas from an experimental standpoint. This makes sense in terms of an overall notion, but what happens if we look at the entire literature? Does this stand up to, to what we're observing experimentally? And so what we did was to evaluate this literature and what we evaluated was the so-called what we called standard hypothesis the standard hypothesis that sort of was never explicitly stated exactly that way those words but collecting across studies we could summarize the idea that emotional stimuli are processed initially via a dedicated modular system that operates rapidly automatically in the sense of without attention and largely independently of conscious awareness and that defects, so this is not just a curiosity for researchers in the lab, it has enormous impact in, in society because defects in these systems would be then, would then underlie phobias, mood disorders, PTSD, and so on and so forth. So we did not do clinical work. We were just looking at the claims from an experimental psychology standpoint and neuroimaging standpoint. And just very briefly, just illustrate one study here. One study that was evaluating this question was, was a study that I did while I was a, a, in Leslie Ungerleiter's lab many years ago in the early 2000s, in which we decided to test the role of attention. And the way we did this, we had the same exact stimuli under two conditions. <laughs> one condition when the participant was told to fixate the middle of the face and indicate whether these faces looked male or female. And so this is what I call the attend to face condition. And in alternating blocks of trials, they had the exact same instructions fixate here. And then there were these bars that were presented peripherally. And these, these trials uh, occurred for around 200 milliseconds to avoid the, tempta the, the, the temptation to move your eyes to the periphery. And subsequently, we used eye tracking to, to make sure that people did not move their eyes and whatnot. You can do all sorts of controls. But in any case, what we wanted to do was to have two conditions with the exact same visual stimuli, just different tasks that you were doing, such that you would attend to the faces or attend to these bars, which were designed to be very difficult to discriminate whether they're the same orientation or different orientation. <clears throat> So what we found, and many people have found, and we expected to find, is that affective processing is indeed prioritized. When we look, for instance, at the responses in behavioral and behavioral data to reaction time, percent correct, and so on and so forth, the response to a fearful face here in red is robustly greater than the response to a, to a neutral face. But what the important finding, that was well known at the time, what was the important finding at the time was that when the person was doing the task, the bar task, then the differential responses, the difference between fear and neutral completely disappeared. We did not detect any difference here in this and in several other subsequent studies. So the conclusion that I would like to suggest is that it's indeed prioritized this form of processing, but it really depends on a multitude of factors, including attention, Awareness, we did masking studies with awareness, context, the context in which something's presented, and so on and so forth. With the conclusion being that effective processing of the kind that Ledoux and others had claimed was completely automatic is not, in a strong sense at least, <laughs> automatic in the sense that had been claimed. Okay, so that was the part with the negative effective processing. Let me just very briefly illustrate something on the uh, apart from the, the appetitive side of the equation. And the appetitive side of the equation is a little tricky. I mean, it's really difficult to study emotion in the lab because obviously you cannot do something that has 
anyone would, it would not be ethical for a person to experience extreme emotion in the lab. Likewise, it's very difficult to study reward. And so reward, we just use secondary uh, cash rewards as a way to manipulate the, the person's uh, motiv <coughs> motivation. But the, 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 the hypothesis that we had here was that motivation would enhance executive function, increasing the likelihood of, of, of attaining a reward in a trial and sort of improving cognition in a selective fashion. So in one of the studies that we did, the one I'm gonna present here today is this, this very simple Stroop-like task. It's a task in which you see a picture with these uh, strings or words on top of them that you were just asked to ignore. So you have a picture of a building with the, these, these letters on top and, and, and you have other conditions in which you have an incongruent, so you have a congruent and an incongruent condition and you have as well houses with a congruent or incongruent, incongruent condition. And we do this task either without giving any extra monetary rewards to the individuals or by offering a total of $20 extra for the series of reward trials that they were going to be performing. And that's the uh, award that they would earn was actually proportional to the number of trials that they got correct. And if they were correct and fast enough, they, they, they got rewarded. So what we did, we, we did obtain a behavioral effect, but just for the sake of time here, I'm going to, to skip that. The behavioral effect indicated that reward indeed decreased the interference of the inconsistent, incongruent uh, little strings or words. So you actually, under reward, you seem to be able to filter out the distractor more effectively. But what I want to show today is, 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 is a little different, is a network analysis that we did in which we selected all the brain regions when this cue was presented. Oh, I don't show the whole paradigm here to save time, but I, at the beginning of the trial starts with a cue that indicates, are, are you in a neutral trial or in a reward trial? So at that cue time, was when we analyzed and performed this 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 um, this network analysis, and so for this network or graph analysis, what we did was we took all the regions in the brain that responded to the reward cues, irrespective of whether they indicated reward or no reward, and we took that a set of regions that we were interested in investigating, and we took the correlation of their time series on a trial by trial basis as the strength of the link between those nodes. So the edges were the fMRI response correlation that we actually could estimate on a trial by trial basis. We can discuss later if, you, if you're interested. So then what we did was like, can we look at this essentially this correlation matrix of all these regions by all these regions that have correlations with each one because they're, we, we take the, the correlation value between all of them into account. And can we do some partition of this whole structure? And we can use standard methods in, in, in network theory. And what we did was we, we did a, a simple community, so-called community detection that detects two clusters, that detected two clusters. And we started by at the no reward condition. During the no reward, reward, re, no reward condition, what we found was two clusters of regions. And apologies for all these abbreviations. But essentially what this means is that there's a series of regions here, many of which were kind of cortical regions, I guess most of them were cortical regions, and another cluster of regions here, mostly in subcortex, that were very strongly correlated, their responses were strongly correlated within that cluster, but weaker correlations between regions of this cluster with the second cluster. So they naturally formed two groups whose correlations within were much stronger than between clusters, okay? So there's nothing inherently correct or unique or super important about this organization. It was just a starting point because what we were really interested in was 
what happens to this organization when we looked at the reward trials. So for the reward trials, what we found if we keep the exact same grouping the same was that almost uniformly all the between cluster links exhibited increased functional correlation. So the interpretation here is that under the neutral condition, these regions have signals that are relatively correlated, mildly correlated, but when you look at the trials that have the chance of reward, they are much more in sync with each other, much more integrated. In other words, there, there's this kind of large scale reorganization of the network that you can think of it as becoming less modular, insular, separated, or you can think of it as becoming more integrated, right? So it's just two sides of the same coin. So what I did here was just to briefly show two examples of the interactions between emotion and cognition in that first example of the, of the face attention task and interactions between reward and cognition in this example here, just to give you a little bit of an example of the kinds of interactions that we have found in our studies in the past couple of decades. But what I wanna to do today really is not go into the minutia of these experiments. I, I really wanna stay uh, for us to stay uh, at, at the at more conceptual level. And I wanna go back to thinking about how do we study the brain? If textbooks are any indication of how we study the brain, then the suggestion, the, the, the idea that they convey is that there are some well-defined se well defined set of mental terms. And the idea is that in each chapter, there might be a development of a given term. For instance, there might be chapters on perception, on attention, memory and learning, language, motor control, executive function. Eventually there'll be a chapter on consciousness, on moral processing or what have you. But the idea is that you have these, these mental, mental, mental terms, these standard mental terms. And the goal then of neuroscience is one of figuring out regular mappings between these domains here, however, whichever they might be, and, and parts of the brain perhaps networks, perhaps regions. This is, this is something that's not necessarily forcing us to, to any, any region by region partitioning, but the, the, the mapping becomes one between these, these terms and these parts of the brain and, and parts of the brain. And, and also it doesn't necessarily have to be just cortical. It can obviously extend throughout the entire uh, nervous system. Yeah, the central nervous system, especially. So what we have then, typically, is accounts that are guided by these standard mental terms, perception, emotion, cognition. And what we see, it's not necessarily that there's anything wrong with that, but what we see is that perhaps because of the reason that we have to explain things in a textbook, but it perpetuates a way of thinking, that really emphasizes independence and separation between these domains, right? So the, the, the idea is that, okay, I study perception, I specialize, I'm a perception experimentalist, a researcher, scientist. Oh, oh, I, I actually, I, I, I do attention, I do, I do language and, oh no, I actually do emotion, it's completely different. It's, it's somewhere else and so, either explicitly or implicitly, there's a tendency of generating a language of neuroscience of books, but also how we convey our science to our peers and certainly to more broadly the community at large, a language that emphasizes independence and separation. And the argument that, I want, that I've been trying to make, I'm making here today briefly, and I think that we should also consider very strongly is the idea of considering the development of languages, a language or terms that 
emphasize instead, or at least in addition to independence and separation, in addition to that, a language that emphasizes interaction and integration is sort of at, the, at, a, at a more core level. <laughs> So let's go back again. How do these mental terms come in psychology? I mean, there's a long history, William James, and even pr prior to William James, there are these chapters that if we see from early editions, they kind of like remain in the history of psychology books since that time. Obviously, there are other kinds of approaches that, that, that exist, a Gibsonian, ecological approach and whatnot. It's, it's not a single monolithic type of enterprise. But these, these, these mental terms really guide a lot of our research. But if we think about how, about the problems that animals have had to confront to survive, so these, 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 the, the problems have been problems that have molded the development of evolutionary speaking of the nervous system. Problems that animals confront in their environments that must be solved in, in all their complexity, right? So the question then is, should we be trying to study the neural circuits and large, and large scale systems that support these classes of behavior? That doesn't mean that they cannot be decomposed. That's an empirical question. We could have, uh, we can have that possibility should be entertained and should be on the table, but we should be at least considering these more integrated types of problems that do not necessarily break all the domains by definition as the person is recruited for an experiment in an experimental lab or in a, in a scanner. Again, so going back to that claim, so we really need a language of intera interaction and integration to really try to attempt to elucidate how brain regions address support these complex behaviors that animals uh, so successfully navigate their world and 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 propagate the species. Okay, so in this sense, what are the kinds of systems that support these these kinds of successful behaviors of these these animals and of ourselves? One way to think about it is in terms of centralized processing systems. So many systems that are complex and the brain is no, no exception, it is really almost instinctive to think that many important functions depend on a, some sort of centralization of its processes. We might think that information gradually reaches prefrontal cortex from the periphery, all all the way up to the prefrontal cortex where it's integrated and represented in a way that is sufficiently abstract that operations can be performed in that abstract space and 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 then revert in reverse in a reverse direction feedback or, or, or feed into motor motor commands if, if feedback in the motor end of things so that eventually you can you can perform motor, motor actions <coughs> So what I would like to suggest is that if not necessarily a complete substitution, but at least for us to consider very seriously the, the possibility that given the architecture that we have been able to study, have, st have studied in the past several decades and understand quite well, that an alternative view of processing would be one in which there is highly distributed processing such that signals travel in multiple directions without a strict hierarchy in a multi-directional flow of information that is much better char characterized as what's sometimes called a heterarchy as opposed to a hierarchy, <coughs> right? So there are, many, there are many ways in which a system involved with thalamocortical loops uh, huge loops involving the amygdala and other many other systems. The details it, not important today, but there are several references in which this, these are these ideas are worked out. If you're interested, but the idea is that on this backbone 
of structural organization that is highly organized. So it's not the suggestion that everything is talking to everything. There is no order. The, 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 the brain is like kind of this Lashley, Carl Lashley spaghetti structure. That is not what is being proposed is that instead that on top of this highly organized system, anatomical system, the functional architecture that follows is, is quite different from this more traditional sequential prefrontal cortex central integrator type of framework. So, so what, what I would like to suggest then is that more broadly we considered form of distributed processing in which these that are circuits that form assemble in a way that spins the entire neural axis so it's not just sort of like this cortical centrism that we've been having for the past 30 plus years and i do neuroimaging i use fmri daily in my research have used it for 20 plus years 25 years now but I have to say that, that one of the implications, one of the repercussions or one of the consequences, I guess, of using this is that we really created this more cortical centric view of brain processing that, seem, that seems to have stuck. So what I'd like to suggest, however, is that we really need to consider circuits that really span the, the neural axis uh, much more actively than we typically do in, in, for instance, typical fMRI work like I do. We should be also thinking in terms of these circuits as assembling in a manner that is highly dynamic and context dependent in the sense that they support behavioral demands and, or challenges that are happening on the go as animals engage and interact in, in their environment. So there's the final couple ideas is, okay, so we suppose we have, okay, what's the big deal? Okay, yeah, we know that there's, it's not completely hierarchical. There's, you know, there's these bypass connections. Yeah, yeah, we've talked about feedback connections for a long time. What are you talking about? Well, what I'd like to suggest is that viewing the system in this decentralized system way, it really suggests different research questions about brain and behavior. Right, so it, it, it's, a, it's something that instead of trying to understand how one region does something, how does the amygdala does exactly this function? How the medial prefrontal cortex, the infralimbic prefrontal cortex, top-down modulates the amygdala such that in extinction you can unlearn the CS contingency that you learn during fear conditioning. So despite all the progress that has been made by in that way, I would suggest that the questions that are equally or more important are questions of understanding the coordination of multiple of these comp the components as instantiating the properties of interest. So there is a shift in the objects of scientist scientific interest such that we are interested in the, in the interest becomes not the parts, but the parts in their interactions, right? So, in other words, instead of investigating property, how property P, property P is encoded in area A, we're trying to understand how these properties arise in a decentralized coordination manner where multiple partners are asynchronously being engaged to capture this behavior or mental state or function of interest and and that's it so if you're interested this um, i'm not advertising I'm asking you to, to 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 buy this book it's it's open access so you can just go to the mit press pages and access this book so but if you're interested in any of these ideas it's it's right there for free thank you very much Thank you very much for questions. Um, okay. Thank you very much. Food for thought. It struck me that in all this 
conceptualization about networks rather than areas, you, there's still the, the central concept that these areas are real. Right? That in, his, in, in essence, Rodman was right. He just didn't see the connections between them. He thought it was maybe individual things. Is that, is that fundamental? Uh, these brain areas that we see real units, or do we actually even have to get away from that? Yeah, I completely failed. No, no, because no, I don't believe that at all. Uh, I don't think Rodman was right. I, I view, for instance, cortex and subcortex as gradients of uh, anatomical properties that do not have natural boundaries. So I do not, I, I should uh, revise the way I pr present this to, to suggest that I don't think it's, a, the, it's not just the interactions between areas that have been neglected, but the, the notion of having a well-defined area, I also think is problematic. I have a philosophical question for you. I want you to do a thought experiment. Imagine we don't have any anatomy or physiology, but we know that human beings walk along from one place to another. And then we could cut them up and we could find bone and muscle and skin and eyes and gastrointestinal tract. Then we wouldn't be able to understand how the bone works, the muscle works, and the skin. I actually think it may well be that we just can't look at the brain in the same way as we look at the body, and that there may well be functional aspects within the brain which we would never see because we don't have a way of looking at it anatomically, including fMRIs. Just, just how would we know with the, with the human being as a black box walking along, we know it walks along, we can cut it up at the end and we find all those different bits. How would we know how those were connected? Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to parse the question, to be honest, <laughs> but because is, is the question, so the question is not about the someone moving, right? It's only about no, the no, brain, no, right? It's about the brain. Being, it's about the brain. The brain being a black box All right. does certain things. We can't, we can't parse out the different bits because we just don't have the technology to do it. So okay. Got it. So I, I do think, well, obviously this is an empirical question, which neuroscience has answered more on the side that we can cut it into the different parts. Right, so was it 2016, the Vanessen Nature paper suggests that the brain, the cortex, I should say, because the other part, what does it do anyway? <laughs> so the, the, cortex, the cortex has 180 areas in each hemisphere. So it's basically, you know, Broadman 7.0 or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so they do, and the entire school of thought that comes from WashU is very strong on the idea that areas do exert very clear cut the beginning slide functions so it's an it's 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 a it's a i'm not claiming that it's an absurd idea i'm just i'm just contrasting with a different view that suggests that we could view it in a in a in a, in a much more complex systems integrated dynamic manner in which these parts are less of the major building blocks than we had thought. Obviously, I could be completely wrong. It's just that we don't have the exact way to parcel, parcelate the cortex that Vanessa was on the right direction, but it's 371. And, and so we have to revise that to version 7.9 or something like that. Yeah. So there's a question uh oh. <laughs> I think you were quite right to say that we should think very carefully about these terms for different mental functions like perception, attention, memory, and so on. So I wonder if they describe tasks rather than functions. But are we going, therefore, to look for new names that map onto how the brain works? Or is this 
just the wrong way to go about it. Yeah, as you can imagine, that is really the central question, one of the central questions. And, and, and in fact, I, I wrote a piece trying to <clears throat> propose that we should look at complex behaviors and people said, oh, basically what you want to do is go back to behaviorism. And I hadn't even thought of that implication because it was definitely not the goal. Obviously, it's not a return to behaviorism. And as, as well as, as the enormous challenge of coming up with a new vocabulary would that be even conceivably possible in science that we after several hundreds of i don't know has there been, ever been a science that changed all of its nomen nomenclature i mean maybe we can change one right we don't like we don't like attention i don't know it's I, actually i like attention but let's suppose we don't like uh, there's one that we don't like and we say it's uh i don't know in, doesn't matter right so so I don't know. I think I, I, f I feel that we're so stuck that one of the ways that I started to talk about this was more, okay, suppose we stay with the same vocabulary or, or you just refine it a little bit with time because science always refine is refining and things like that. But how about if we, even if we maintain those, t those, those ways of talking, if we really became a little bit more specific, what I mean by attention in this context is exactly this with these interactions, with these temporal properties and whatnot, because first, I, 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 some of you might know that I studied the impact of attention, emotional attention, affective attention. And, and at one point I started documenting how could this take place mechanistically. And there's like seven different types of circuit that could be exerting this influence. Amygdala could be projecting directly to V1 and it does. Parietal cortex could be exerting top down because some other circuit engages the, the, the parietal cortex via the amygdala or via the insula. So there is a whole range in which of ways in which this could take place. So I think if we became a little bit more careful in how we emphasize for this kind of attention, what we mean is this, and I, I'm sure that many, many of us do carefully word these things and do it, but I think we suffer from a little bit of, um, shall I say sloppiness as sometimes we use some of these terms. Yeah. Um, I've got a slightly provocative Okay. <laughs> um, so Carl Zillis's grand vision mm -hmm. to fractionate <coughs> the cerebral cortex into its components, extending uh, Brodman's ideas and using <clears throat> chemo architecture, receptor architecture now, even finer gradations of mm -hmm. cyanoarchitecture. architecture. Um, your, your approach is suggesting that maybe maybe some of that is less useful now than he would have envisaged, envisaged it to be. What are we going to do with all that data? No, no. Well, I, I mean, the, the Carl Zillis situation is interesting because I think what is happening in neuroscience now, I mean, we just had right a few a weeks ago, is it a month ago, that this, this um, these, I don't know, was it 20 papers that came out in science with, with 2000 or who remembers 20,000 or 2000 cell types in the brain and this mega initiative reporting through a very large number of, of different ty cell types. And so, so what, I, what I think is going to happen is, is that, again, it's a complete guess, right? So that is so multivariate in terms of cell types uh, with distribution of receptors, receptor types and uh, glial supporting systems and this and that and concentration of inhibitory subclasses and so on that you're gonna, you're gonna find these gradients everywhere. So, so there's, it's such a complex object that it doesn't mean that it, you can't look at structure, but you can look at it's so it's so multivariate that you can look at different slabs of of organization. I want to emphasize receptor density by cell type by something else else, and then you see something, or you can look at seventeen other parameters. And so it's it's and and, and it might if you did a if you did an uh, um, let's say principal component analysis or whatever, there might be ways to put this into lower dimensions. But the claim would be that, sure, in a sense, that could be in lower dimensions, let's say six dimensions. So maybe you could. But animals behaving in an actual world with 
all the challenges that happen, even, even dimensions that explain less variance might be tremendously important because they have distributed effects or non-local effects or, or subtle effects that you know, someone is, is, more, is, is more receptive to some kind of drug versus someone who doesn't, it doesn't work at all. And, and so I think that in the end, it, it is incredibly valuable but I don't see it valuable as in a way of carving, right? It's not like a piece of meat. I, I like this cut and I don't like this cut. Oh, I shouldn't say that, right? Because everyone is, is, is vegetarian or vegan here. <laughs> so apologies. I guess in America, that's acceptable. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I agree with you that many of the functions, it's still a Chris's question, but many of the functions you gave, like permission, emotion, even fear or Christmas spirit, <laughs> both localized to a brain region, but I think that means that it's not decomposable. So I still believe yeah. that you will be able to ascribe a function to a brain area of some kind. In the same way, you can say the function of the retina is <coughs> photons, or the function of the <coughs> cortex is to detect bars. It may be that the <coughs> are not important, but what is important is connections. So I agree with you that the function region will relate to what it connects to. Uh, I think structure is probably also important. Mm -hmm, yeah. But the reason, and in some, in your, I, think, I think you will be able to describe function to parts of the brain. Other functions may be better described by networks, if you're talking about. But the reason I'm confident about that is that the same decom decomposition has worked in other fields of biology. So the cell is a very complex organism, but we've understood it to some extent in biology by breaking into parts. And then talking about how parts interact to subserve more complex functions like movement of a single cellular organism. So, if you look at other parts of biology, why do you think that we can't decompose <coughs> the into parts and describe functions as parts? Yeah, I, I, I think that, uh, I mean, in the end, it's an empirical question, right? So, it's these two research programs. And so, there's two aspects. One is to not neglect another research program that is more integrationist versus more massively reductionist. But I would argue. That, for instance, I don't know if you've read the, the <coughs> Philip Ball's uh, recent book on life, on genetics and cell, and it's, it's essentially is very much in line with the view that this, this cutting into parts is problematic at the level of the cell as well. So I do think, I'm not saying it is or isn't, what I'm saying is that the jury, the jury is still out, I think, in terms of how well we can understand biological phenomena in the way that we've been trying. So for instance, the example that, that Philip Ball gives and, and, and I would give is, is that <coughs> the utter failure, the disastrous, not disastrous, but the monumental failure of the, the human, the human uh, genome project, which they thought, they thought they would map the whole thing out. And by now we would have personalized medicine. My medicine would be completely different from yours. They're completely bewildered with what happened. This, the, the, the genotype, the, the, gene, the mapping gene to phenotype was like, wait, this is way too complicated. And, and it only seems to be spiraling in the direction of more complication. So I, I don't know if I think biology is such so amenable to that paradigm. It might be. I think it would be awesome if it did because it's easier, right, if anything. I think scientifically, because I can work slightly separately from you and we can unite our results, right? That's how science works. That's a <laughs> Is it what? That science requires explanation at that level. You need to describe the parts of the organism to understand how they interact. That's almost how we understand, I think. Well, we have to going to start understanding slightly differently. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, um, just a question of, sort of how we start understanding that very differently. You have all of these paradigms that have been, especially in psychology, that have been developed in order to study these systems as their own systems, like memory paradigms, attentional paradigms, um, and they, they are paradigms that have been created with the idea that there are these separate systems for those uh, processes in mind. So if we are studying how they interact, then does that require a whole new set of methodology to look at these processes in a completely different way? Or um, is it still, could it be appropriate to still study memory as a separate thing, but then an emotion as a separate thing, but then, you know, you, you have to um, 
create those variables within those paradigms and, mm -hmm. and work from yeah. the stuff we yeah. already have. No, I, I, I do think, I don't think, I'm not, I'm not suggesting we throw everything away. I'm suggesting that we sort of like, we go into this, these problems, not with a strong supposi supposition that of strong independence as we had in the past, as we tended to in the past. So we go into these problems, anticipating that there could be important interactions. And so again, it gets to the question of language and how should we use it, the terms. I think it's a can of worms, of course, but I, I don't think that it, I'm not suggesting that, you know, we need a complete reset of the whole enterprise, <laughs> I think, but um, in, in my better days, I don't think. Um, but I do think there are, there are a lot of challenges because I think we do start with problems with them completely separate and then trying to see how much traction we get them by treating them separately. So I, I've always, I, I did the same thing, but I've always found that they're so interlocked that now I try to start from a more interlocked way and see how I can understand. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess one of the arguments made about the way we studied in the past and uh, that trying to ascribe single functions to single regions wouldn't, uh, doesn't necessarily right. And I, and I agree with you that some particularly, say, population experiments, for example, uh, in animals or when you see them in humans, they suggest a requirement for that area for a specific function, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the only area which is involved. <coughs> so I wonder if we, sh and, and somehow that logic sometimes gets mixed up, people mm -hmm. go and put the requirement in that, that region be alone. I wonder if we could flip it and say, could we think about it as what's sufficient to which areas or actors in which areas are sufficient to produce that behavior? And rather than think about taking out regions and saying that's required, we think about the sufficiency uh, to generate that behavior. And because I think there's an inherent problem with taking regions out of a complex network, the network just rearranges and finds another way. Um, what do you think about the sufficiency question? Yeah, I, I think I think that the, I, I think it does make sense to think to some extent that the area provides a, a sizable contribution to a process. And, and so I, I, again, it's my own bias is, is not that it's, it's, it's not working in isolation, it's working in, 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 in a joint fashion, but that doesn't mean that it's the exact same, you know, it's not like a soccer team, everyone is playing the exact same role, right? They're very distinct roles. So, I mean, th these regions have, very different receptors, very different cell types, potentially different connections. So what they can contribute to to the overall team is is going to be it's going to be quite different. And, and it could be in some cases that it's sufficient to provide a, an important component of that behavior is is really dependent on on those contributions because of what it can do with with, with its own organization at the fine level of receptors and the genetic expression and so on and so forth. Um, I just a humbling thing, it's a start for neuroscience this year, one of the opening plenaries was on the connected connectome of the fruit fly, the yeah. most comprehensive wiring map to date. Uh -huh. And then they think about going to the mouse, which I think is a bit of a leap. Do right. you see any translational value in looking at the more simple animals and the complexity of working that out is a humbling exercise in looking at those connect connections, particularly if they're functional. That was a great word. So do, do you see any translational value? In translational that? in the technical translation to human sense? Well, just in the, in the basic mechanisms, what they work across. Oh, I have, ab I have absolutely no hope about that. <laughs> absolutely no hope. I, I mean, I'm a neuroscientist and I'm completely obsessed with neuro, with brains and neuro, nervous systems for what they are. I mean, I find it, I found the mouse brain as inherently fascinating, the fly brain and, and understanding general principles of computation and all sorts of things, but in, 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 in ways that would translate, I, 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 I'm very skeptical because I think that evolution really Reorganize, reorganize the brain in, in, in sufficient ways that the translation is going to be 
minimal. I mean, there's, there's some level of translation, but it's not at the level of, <laughs> oh, we see an amygdala in this animal and there, so it's conserved. What does that even mean? It's actually, even its distribution of, of receptors and genetic gene expression and connectivity is different. So, I mean, conserved in what sense? Yeah, in, in some sense it's conserved, but not in the important functional sense, I think. It's, you know, again, it's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, there's a question. Yeah. Um, is it possible that this question of reduction to kind of basic systems in the brain is a little bit too binary in the sense that obviously you have very evolutionary distinct parts of the brain and the cortex is a much more well, a cognitively much more abstract and a higher level than something like the amygdala. So historically you've taken the bottom up approach and tried to segregate parts of the amygdala or, 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 or all of the older systems into functions, which I think has worked. I mean like the um, you can pick out a selection of neurogenetic neurons in the LC that are responsible for some ethical arousal. Sure. And that's an obvious function that's been pretty well established since like 92 or whatever it was. And then if you look at the cortex and the higher cortical fields, taking a bottom approach hasn't really comes anywhere because of the explanatory gap and the question of the and everything else. So I wonder whether it's more fruitful to think about systems or functional pathways only in those kind of um, higher levels of abstraction and the newer areas of the brain. And it's still maybe useful to take a reductionist approach in the older parts. Uh, yeah, that, that's really interesting because one of the things that I've been doing the last five, 10 years is, is really uh, trying to focus more on the down there. And again, the more we look into it, the more flexible and integrated it seems. So even the periaqueductal gray in the midbrain has these circuits that go via the thalamus that regulate the extent to which the amygdala actually learns during classical conditioning. And so periaqueductal gray was completely thought about this kind of like mega boring output station just says, you know, freeze or, or run, you know, like uh, flight or flight, you know, and it's the <coughs> output thing, but it's, it's embedded in these loops and in, in, in super complex ways that now they're, they're, they're suggesting that they can find predictions being encoded in the periaqueductal gray that actually circle back to, to affect other higher levels of processing. So I guess maybe it's a, great, a matter of gradient, so perhaps a little bit less, but it's still enormously rich and complex. So look, um, Louis, there are loads more questions, um, <laughs> but I think we'll probably have to break it to a close. If you do have questions, maybe. I'm here, I'm around. <laughs> Terrific. Um, Let's just close by giving a, a massive round of applause.